Hello and welcome. Let me be the first to welcome you to the 2020 Study of Genesis and Bible Study Fellowship. I am so thankful that you are joining this study with us, and this is going to be a great one. So the elephant in the room is that we are not meeting in one giant physical space, as I'm sure you are already aware of. Um, we are going to be meeting in lots of different locations. And uh, the other day I was reading in the book of Philemon, and the way that Paul opens that uh, book is he said, he reaches out to all the home churches, and he says, grace and peace be with you. So I feel like I'm in the same situation where I'm reaching out to people in Zoom, there are people meeting in office workplaces, there are people meeting in homes, and my message to you is grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ to you. So um, as we get started in this study, I just want to challenge you this year to really um, seek what God is, is saying through the book of Genesis. We're going to get a lot of time to go into a lot of details. What my, my goal for the, today is to just introduce this Genesis study in a way that can just get our heart fixed on, on what God has for us and start looking at some of the bigger themes going on in the book of Genesis. So as we start every lecture, I want to start by worshiping God. So I came across a hymn recently that I think really says perfectly um, a little bit about the book of Genesis and about the Bible as a whole. So let's bow our hearts as we, as we think about these words. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength, help us cope. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Holy words of our faith, handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice, Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be in your word and to, to have a community that can rally around your word. Lord, we know that you are the name above all names. You are the Lord of all. With a word, you spoke the whole universe into creation. And Lord, we are part of your creation. And the creation seeks to know their creator a little bit more every day. So Lord, as we reach out to you, we pray that you would just bless this journey that we're on to know you more and to ask some hard questions. Lord, open our hearts to the hard questions that we have deep within us. Lord, challenge us, equip us, strengthen us, give us a measure of courage, and Lord, just bless this journey ahead. We pray that we would honor you through this study, and we pray that you would just speak into our hearts in a powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we focus on our new beginning, we start where the Bible began. So the year was 1400 BC. A man named Moses stood at the base of Mount Sinai, and in front of him were hundreds of thousands of faces of God's people. These were people who had an even rougher life than what we've had in the year 2020. They were born into slavery. We don't maybe know what slavery, slavery would be like, but they were born with their hopes and their dreams just being thrown out the door because they, were, they belonged to somebody else. They were a property of somebody else. And day in and day out, they had to do back-breaking work every day. So they, they even were in a situation where they were 400 years removed from when they could see God was moving through the people of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. These people 
just had completely given up on God. They figured he had forsaken them, he had left them, there was, there was no chance at reconciling with God. They were just on their own from this point on. And then one day, God intervened in their lives and showed them that he never left them. He brought on Pharaoh the plagues of the, the blood in the Nile River. He brought the, the flies and the locusts and the frogs and the dead livestock. He brought dark night over Egypt. He brought hail and the first Passover. And as they witnessed all of this, you can only imagine they were thinking about, wow, the power of God is, is amazing. This, he can do anything that he wants. He can move mountains if he wants. And then as they walked out of Israel, they actually, they walked to the, to the Red Sea and they witnessed God splitting the sea right in front of them. So truly, they had a sense of God's wrath, his power. They saw his anger against Pharaoh. And they were asking themselves some difficult questions. Who is this God? Is this God for us? Is he going to lead us into the desert and just leave us for another 400 years? Is he a God that's going to walk with us forever? How are we going to, how can we live with this God? How can we be among him? He's too powerful for us. And to top it all off, they, set, they stood here in front of Mount Sinai and they looked up at this mountain that was glowing with the power of God. And it was, it was a calm night, but there was thunder coming out of the mountain. They could feel it. The, the ground was even shaking with it. And it wasn't just your average thunder. They could hear the voice of God in this thunder. And what he said was, come up this mountain. And everyone stood still as God spoke. And they all knew that that voice was directed at Moses. And so Moses, he's an 80-year-old man at this point. He's a shepherd, and he's, he's standing there, you know, wondering, okay, what do I do now? I've got all these people I'm supposed to lead. So he sighs, he looks at the people, and he turns, and he climbs up this mountain. As he climbs up the mountain, he sees the, the power of God getting brighter and brighter as he's climbing higher and higher on this mountain. At a certain point, the brightness of God is so bright that it's just white all around him. He can't see even the hand in front of his face. So he just continues to move forward just towards the presence of God. He moves slowly and he, he just almost trips, but he, he's just fumbling along until he hears God speak. And it sounds like he's not very far away. God says, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. And so Moses does as God asks. He kneels down on the ground with his forehead to the ground, and he waits for his creator, for the Lord Almighty, to speak. In that moment, Moses' heart was just pounding. He didn't know if he was going to survive this, this experience, but he, he waited. And then God spoke. And here's the first things that he said to Moses. He said, incline your heart to every word which I shall speak to you on this mount and write them in a book in order that their generations may see how I have not forsaken them. You will not change one word and you will not change one letter. Moses struggled to respond. He just said, yes, Lord. Yes, I will do this, Lord. So the people, they saw the anger of God, but what God was showing Moses in this moment was compassion. He knew that those people had a strong desire to know their creator, to know their Lord. And so in that moment, he was full of compassion. He said, if they want to know me, I want to show them who I am. And so God revealed himself to the people of God, of Israel. And he did that by giving them his word. And so right there in front of Moses, God spoke the first words of Genesis, which would eventually be stitched on Moses' heart, and he would carry those words with him, and he would relay those words to all the other people around him, and one day it would be written on scrolls, and the scrolls would be put into books, and the books would be given to friends and neighbors and family members, and they would give it to their friends and neighbors and family members until it spread 
through almost the known world. And so here is the first words that God spoke to Moses. This is the new beginning of God's word transforming lives. He said, Bereshit bara Elohim hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. In Hebrew, this means in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so began the book of the Bible. And what opened the book of Genesis opened up a collection of five books called the Torah. The Torah is made up of the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, these five books together. So as we'll take a little bit of closer look at what is the Torah, how did, why did God give us this first segment of the Bible all in five books? You may be wondering what's, what's even being said through the Torah. Mo most people will tell you that the Torah is the law of Moses. It even gets referred to in the Bible as the law of Moses. If we break down the word, we'll see there's another meaning that's hidden inside that word. So the word Torah has four level letters, and the letters are like T-O-R-H in our English understanding. The ancient Hebrew letters look like symbols. I have those in the middle of your screen. So there's Tav, Vav, Resh, and He are these four letters. The first letter, Tav, it looks like an English T. It was referred to symbolically by the ancient Jews as the cross. The second letter is called the Vav, and it is like a nail or a spear. It has a straight line with a top on it, just like a nail or a spear would have. The third letter is a little bit more complicated. It's called the Resh, which is like the letter R. It looks like a human head, and it has the symbolic meaning of the head or the leader or you might call it the king. Over time, that resh changed slightly to be rosh. Rosh has the symbolism of wickedness or evil. So it has two meanings throughout history. It depends on, are you talking in an ancient context or a modern context? It either meant the leader, the king, or it meant wickedness or evil, depending on the time that you were looking at this letter. The fourth and final letter is the he which means behold, or it is revealed. So if we look at these four letters, we get a true sense of what was going on in the Torah. Behold, the king of the Jews is nailed to the cross. So we can see even thousands of years before Jesus came to us in the flesh, before that time, Jesus was already in the middle of the word Torah. And he was already throughout the book of the Torah. And as we see the, that, that R, it changed over time. So that became, behold, sin is nailed to the cross. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So amazingly, both of these meanings show us Jesus' sacrifice. They show us the way to salvation. So the book of the Torah, if we were to take a step back, this book is not just about the law. This is not like a law textbook. This is a book about Jesus being revealed over time. As we look now with our eyes towards Jesus, we can open up the book of Genesis and see that Jesus is on every page. Jesus is in every chapter. Thousands of years in advance, God had a plan of redemption, and God put his son right in the forefront of his word. So this, this detail of Jesus being present in God's word is one of the many details that is, is so fascinating to me as a Christ follower. But there are so many other details even that would blow your mind, that show us prophecy, that show us God's design, that show us his perfect will, that show us the attributes of who God is. So I was reading in, in the second chapter of Genesis this year, and I realized there's some details there, and I have this urgency to just skim past the details and jump ahead to the next part. But this time was different. I decided I'm gonna take some details in the book of Genesis, and I'm gonna dig until I hit bedrock, and I'm gonna find out what does it say about God. And so here is Genesis 2.10, which is a very fascinating verse to me. 
it says, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pison. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The name of the second river is the Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So what we have here is a Bible verse that gives us the location of Eden. This sounds like the beginning of an Indiana Jones film. So I, I, the fascination that I had for this verse, the, the curiosity that I had, I really wanted to, to dig deeper and see, okay, can I actually find Eden, the Garden of Eden, on a map? So we start in Google Earth, and I find where the Tigris and the Euphrates meet. And this seems like such an easy place to start. These are two very popular rivers. These form the border of nations. What if I just start here? So when I look on uh, Google Earth, I find that they do meet, and I find that at the place where they meet, there is an Eden Memorial Park. So this seems like we found Eden, hasn't it? There's a very large tree there, and there's even a Bible verse off to the side. But the bad news is we're missing two of the four rivers, and I can't find any other rivers nearby that fit the description. There's really no other rivers that all meet together at one head. So I kind of broadened my search, and I decided, let's look at the whole Middle Eastern region. Have we been looking too closely at the Tigris and the Euphrates? Maybe there's a bigger idea going on here. So uh, Genesis 2.10 says that the Gihon was winding through the entire land of Cush. So the land of Cush, you can tell from other spots in the Bible, that refers to the continent of Africa. So I took some time looking through Africa, and it just seems so clear because of the way that the Nile River flows from the north to the south, that that would be the most prominent river in that area. So I think it's a pretty good guess to say that the Gihon, it could be the ancient name for the Nile River. The second river is the Tigris, very easy to find, as I've already said. The third river is the Euphrates, also very easy to find. The fourth river is where we have lots of problems. It's called the Paisan. We get two clues, which is good. We get the fact that it was near gold and it was in the land of Havilah. If you look through a bunch of ancient maps on Google, which is what I did, I found that Havilah refers to Saudi Arabia, especially the northern part of Saudi Arabia. You can see it in lots of different maps. The other little detail I looked into, I found that the northern part of Saudi Arabia was at one point called the Cradle of Gold, and there was a giant gold rush in that exact region at, in 3000 BC, which is very intriguing. If you look at satellite pictures of Saudi Arabia, you'll see canyons and dried up riverbeds that seem to have at one point flowed through the middle of Saudi Arabia. We're talking about the pre-flood world. We're gonna talk about Noah's flood a little bit this year in our study of Genesis. Before Noah's flood, there may have been rivers there that were destroyed as a result of the flood. We know that the flood did, made major changes in the entire landscape of the world. It probably moved you know, islands and mountains, it rearranged streams and, and rivers, and it changed where wildlife settles. It was a complete redo on, on the planet Earth, pretty much. So now we have all four rivers, but the problem is they don't actually come together. They're kind of, they're kind of separated by some distance there. So this is kind of where the trail grows cold, and this is why it's not very straightforward to find Eden on a map, because you've got to find a way to connect these four. If I were to speculate and connect them in the most obvious way, that, that I can see with my eye, I roughly get them connecting together near Israel. This would make a lot of sense because God's word continually flows in and out of Israel. We see Israel on just about every book of the Bible we see, and we see that Jesus spent most of his life in Israel, um, the, the patriarchs were in Israel, 
and there's a lot of the, the King David stories are in Israel. It just seems like the focal point of God's word. So if he was going to focus there, why not start his whole story in Israel? Also, when I visited Israel a couple years ago, I noticed there is a spring in Jerusalem that's known as the Gion Spring. And I've always been curious to see if that spring could have had some ancient connection to the Gihon River, which is, we're speculating, is the Nile River. And it's, it's very intriguing that if it was a spring, that would be water flowing up out of the ground. The Bible tells us that these headwaters flowed up out of the, the ground in Eden. The third interesting fact is that there's an ancient Jewish tradition that Adam and Eve are buried in Hebron in Israel. There's a cave called Machpelah, which is a very f famous burial spot. They believe that Abraham is buried there and Adam and Eve are buried there. So that's another interesting uh, detail that kind of brings the whole story into this one spot. There is a fourth thing that is very interesting, and I spent a lot of time kind of diving deeper on this. There's a town in Israel called Shechem. Okay, and I have uh, a spot for Shechem on the map right here. As we read through um, Genesis, we are going to see Shechem a lot this year. So I want you to spend a little bit of time getting familiar with this place because we're going to be coming and going constantly through Shechem. The reason why they call it Shechem is because the, the word Shechem means shoulders. And if you look at a picture of Shechem, you will see two giant mountains that look like a pair of shoulder blades. So the, the one mountain is the Mount, Mount Ebal, and the other one is Mount Gerizim. Okay, so these are the two mountains that make up Shechem. So as we kind of study the people who come in and out of Shechem, the first person that really draws attention to this spot is Abraham. We're going to spend a decent amount of time this year studying Abraham and getting to know what his story is and what his connection is with God. So Abraham started his life way off east in Iraq. And he traveled 900 miles across the desert, across the Middle East, and the spot where he stopped when he was done with his journey was right in Shechem between these two mountains. We're told that he stopped at a, at a special tree, and the tree was called the Tree of Moray, the Great Tree of Moray, even. And what, what that really means through Hebrew is the Tree of Teaching. So he traveled 900 miles to stand in front of the tree of teaching. If we were to make the, those two mountains into shoulder blades, the tree of teaching would form the neck. It's smack dab right in the middle of those two trees. Later on, we meet Abraham's grandson, whose name is Jacob. Jacob also makes numerous trips to the tree of teaching. At some point in his life, as we'll study this year, he takes a wife, and then he marries that wife's sister, and then he takes on two more handmaidens. So he now has four spouses, and he basically you know, has, has 12 boys and one girl through these four women. At one point, as they're moving, they uh, realize that one of these wives has hidden false idols in their, their horse saddle. And Jacob, who is zealous for God, he decides, I can't have false idols around me. So he takes those four idols, and he buries them in the ground right at the foot of the tree of teaching. The next thing we see is that Jacob comes back to that plot of land later on in our story to worship God. He builds an altar right there in the shadow of the tree of teaching. And he also, with the land that he's purchased, he builds a well. So again, there's water springing up from the ground, just like in Eden. So this well is, becomes a very famous well. It's, we refer to it as Jacob's well. And this is right at that very same spot. So years later, there's famine in Israel. And the Israelites go down to Egypt to get some food because they cannot find anything in Israel. In Egypt, the Israelites, like I said, they are enslaved for 400 years. God appoints a man named Joshua who finishes Moses' exodus of, out of uh, Egypt. And Joshua is kind of like a conqueror, and he basically conquers all of these other spots in Israel because now they've lost their homeland. So as they regain their homeland, 
Joshua takes the people of God to the tree of teaching. He sets some of them up on one side of the mountain and some of them up on the other side of the mountain. And he sets, um, he sets the Ark of the Covenant right there at the foot of the tree of teaching. Here's what the verse says in Joshua 24, 25. It says, On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. By the way, also when they left Egypt, they carried with them the bones of Joseph who had died in Egypt. And he said, I wanna be buried in Israel. They took his bones to the tree of teaching and they buried him there. So at this point, you start to see a pattern. There's also um, a man named Gideon, and he fought a, a lot of the Philistines in that area much, much later in history. This is a different part of the Old Testament. And when he died, his, his son became king. They decided to anoint his son king right there in front of the tree of teaching. So the people of this region are really venerating this tree quite a bit. This, is, this tree is set apart. This is not just your standard tree. So you see how this tree has a focus, and in our study of Genesis, we're gonna focus on the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can I propose a very big what if question? What if the tree of teaching was one of those two trees in the Garden of Eden? So there's one other thing that happened at this spot that I think really highlights the potential for this being the spot for the garden. What if Jesus at some point was actually at that spot as well? Jesus, he lived most of his life in the north of Israel. And Jerusalem was kind of a bit further south. And so when Jesus had to travel to Jerusalem for one of the feast days, he would generally walk you know, from north to south. He would make that journey quite a bit. Usually, you, as you walk from north to south, you would avoid kind of part of the center of Israel. That part is called Samaria. Samaritans and Jews had a long-standing feud, and it was a really dangerous area. If you were a Jew walking in that area, you could be attacked. So as he was walking south this particular time, uh, the disciples really tried to sway him. You need to go around this area. This is not gonna be good for us. But Jesus insisted on going directly into Samaria and going directly for the tree of teaching. As Jesus walked towards this tree of teaching, he stopped at Jacob's well, the very same well we just talked about, and he met a Samaritan woman. This conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman is really fascinating when you consider the fact that maybe God had a conversation with Adam in this very same spot, and separated by 4,000 years, we have Jesus having a discussion with the Samaritan woman. So in the garden, after Adam ate from the apple, Genesis chapter 3 says, The Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 4,000 years later, we have in Shechem, John chapter 4, it says, Jesus was tired from the journey and sat down by the well. So in both cases, we have God walking into the scene. In the garden, God called to the man, Where are you? Adam said to God, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. God responded, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? 4,000 years later at the well, Jesus said, where is your husband? I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you live with now is not your husband. This is a familiar scenario that we all find ourselves in, unfortunately. Mankind was told by God that something was not good, but rather than trust God, we decided that God wasn't for us. God's way is too hard or too impractical. We say God doesn't understand us. He doesn't get what it's like to be weak, to be human, to be curious, to be vulnerable. Sure, God said, fill in the blank, but he's God, I can't measure up. Does any of that sound familiar in your own life? 
We can't hide from God. And in the wake of choosing the wrong thing, choosing sin, we find ourselves face to face with our own shame. You can hear it in Adam's voice in the voice of the woman of, at the well. At the well, Jesus asked the woman, will you give me a drink? The woman said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus responded, if you knew the gift of God, you would have been given living water. God keeps reaching out to us. He hasn't given up on us. The failures that weigh us down can pull us further and further from relationship with God. The truth is this, God won't love you more because of your good works, and God won't love you less because of what you've done. His love is unconditional. His mercy is everlasting. He has good things for us, a purpose, a life, a place in his kingdom, and the offer of his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Too often we resist God's call. We say, I don't deserve God's righteousness, or I can't handle what he's asking of me. Jesus offers us a gift, one that we can't earn, but this gift makes all the difference in our life. Back in the garden, Adam said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Eve goes on to explain, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. This is the oldest story in the book. We've sinned against God and God alone, and yet we demand that anyone else should shoulder the blame but us, ironically in a place referred to as the shoulders. You and I have experienced this. We've witnessed trauma and defeat and crisis and collapse and failure. I don't think there is a word more loathed by men than the word failure. We can't stand the thought of being a failure. So we find anything else to shift the blame to. We re-examine our motives and we said, we did the best with the situation that we were in. We, we messed up so bad that we are in a situation that we can't repair on our own. We need a savior because we messed up. Jesus came back to this spot after 4,000 years to the birthplace of sin because he had to tell us something. He isn't telling us how flawed we are. He isn't condemning us or scolding us. He's saying, I found a way to fix this. I am the way. He went back to the garden to make it clear that he never left our side. His love endures, his grace endures, his mercy endures. And the road to the cross had to go back through the garden. Today, if you try to find Shechem on a map, again, it's gonna be hard to find. They've renamed that town Nablus, but you can still find it pretty easily because of the two giant mountains. If you look at a satellite picture, you won't actually find a tree in the middle. I was trying to find a picture, can I, you know, get a picture of that tree, but it's probably been paved over and built on top of. It's possible that what happened to the tree of teaching is that they cut down the tree, they made it into some logs, a carpenter hand planed off to square off the edges, and they delivered it to the Romans to be used as an ancient cross. We were told in the garden that the consequence for the wrong action was death. But rather than death falling on us, God sent his son to take the punishment in our place. That cross came out of the garden. At the well, the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. If you look through the gospel, it's rare to see Jesus declare himself as the Messiah so plainly and so publicly. I think Jesus recognized her desire for truth and he blessed her with truth. We are embarking on a journey that will take 30 weeks to complete. The journey is not to a place like Eden or Shechem, but the journey is about seeking truth, the truth about you and the truth about God. When we study the Bible, we ask ourselves hard questions. Where do you stand with God today? What is God's will for your life? What is God's purpose for you? I suspect these are just the, the initial questions. You have many, many more questions. And as we read Genesis, you will have an opportunity to seek answers to these questions. We have an urgency to find answers, don't we? And I have good news. God is eager to provide answers. 
The woman at the well spoke by faith when she said, he will explain everything to us. I also believe that he will explain everything to us in his good and perfect timing. I've experienced this personally in a very real way. I come across things in scripture that are puzzling and I ask God for insight through prayer. Sometimes the answer pops into my head in an unexpected way. Sometimes I'm reading the Bible and the answer is right there in front of me. Sometimes God uses friends and family or some verse that I come, come across. I can assure you that someone in your discussion group this year will deliver insight to you that you've been waiting for and struggling with. It may be from a mature believer or a brand new believer, but it will be the Holy Spirit that does the talking. God will work in mysterious ways, but I have confidence that he will lead you towards truth and he will lead you towards himself. While God reveals the answer, he chooses to transform us along the way to be ready to hear the answer as God intends us to hear it. The truth leads us somewhere, to a revelation of God's glory. You will come to find that God is bigger, God is stronger, God can forgive more, we can fear less, and God's vision is bigger. We are smaller, God's plans are better, despite how far we fall short. If you walk away with one thing from this talk, I hope it's this. God's glory is revealed through God's word. I hope you're hungry to experience God's glory. I hope there is something within you that is eager to draw you closer to God and encounter a greater revelation of who he is. Back in the days of Moses, I marvel at the fact that God's people needed so much. They needed food and water and shelter. They needed protection from the elements. But what God gave them wasn't just, you know, a handout of food or water, or it wasn't a temporary dwelling. It was himself, and it was his word that he gave to Moses. That was what they really needed, more than any other temporary items. As we study his word, the truth revealed points to God's all-sufficient, all-powerful glory. His glory as creator, redeemer, and sustainer. 2020 has been a really strange year by all accounts, as I'm sure you will agree. In my lifetime, I can pretty safely say that there's never been a year like it. We had a global pandemic, we had protests and riots, we had racism in the, in the national conversation again, and the harsh reality of injustice in our world. I imagine every person in this room has been affected by the events of 2020 in some way or another. Some of you are just worn out from this year and you just need the rest of God. God knows your heart, and maybe you've called out to him with questions and you've been seeking answers. That's what it's like to hunger for God's glory. You wanna see it, you wanna experience it. You want, it. you want the closeness of God, you want intimacy with God. You know God is worthy to provide you with answers, but he's still readying you to hear it. This Genesis study is an opportunity to witness God's people. These are not men who are perfect or have it all figured out. These are some broken men. This is the story of God's glory, but it's told through the lens of men who are prideful, disobedient, frustrated, enslaved, ashamed, and defeated. God, in effect, told them, I can't use your best effort or your selfish motives or your finest attempts or your biggest title but I can use your surrender. Is your heart prepared to open the book of Genesis and receive a new revelation of God? Are you ready for a new beginning in your relationship with God? Are you ready to experience God's glory in his word in a brand new way? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the revelation that you've given us in your word of who you are. It changes everything because now we know whose we are. Lord, help us in this journey. Help us to see you in all the right places. Help, help us to have discernment about your word and how we can live this out. Lord, we're reaching out through some difficult times right now and we know that you 
are able to, to give us protection and to give us salvation and to give us truth. But Lord, help us to recognize it. We know we're going to find truth in lots of different ways. Lord, just give us eyes so we can see where truth is in front of us. Lord, open our hearts so that we are ready to receive who you are. Lord, challenge us with difficult questions. Encourage us to take the steps forward and help us to just step away from anything that would distract us from you. Lord, as we walk through this year, we pray for every man and every child that's a part of this program. We pray that you would bless this study and this journey until we can see you so much more clearly in the weeks ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.